Hispanic Heritage Month means a lot to our employees here at Cross Country. And we wanted to get someone um, who I believe is going to resonate with, you know, with all of you. You know, I want to take, um, you know, a few moments to thank the, the representative of Cross Country Impact. You know, Cross Country Impact is our, yeah, is it, our diversity group within Cross Country. And, you know, one thing that I can say when this group was founded, you know, the thought process was that we wanted to hear from all of our employees, from every level of diversity, from, you know, age, women, minorities, um, you know, disability. We wanted to hear from everyone, right? And this is why this group was founded. Um, we also wanted to represent every holiday that would come up uh, and make sure that that, you know, cross country healthcare is living up to what we have said we were going to live up to. So we walk the walk, we talk the talk. In creating cross country impact, I believe we have done that. You know, I'm putting a plug in for cross country impact because I would love to have more members like all of the people who are in this call join cross country impact. And you can see all of the wonderful things that we have planned for the remainder of the year, not only Latinx Heritage Month, but, you know, all of the different holidays that are coming up, you know, cross country impact will be a force and we will provide different programs to all of our employees. So I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of the members of cross country impact for recommending and putting this program together. I think it's going to be a dynamic program from a dynamic speaker who is going to be so engaged. Um, you know, feel free after, you know, Maureen makes her presentation, ask any questions, but hopefully, you know, you'll see what I'm talking about. I've had the opportunity to speak with Maureen over the last, you know, two weeks or so, and I'm telling you, you guys are in for a treat. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this on, um, turn this over to Sam and Maureen um, to give a little bit about our background and the video. And she was little, one of those box things, those punching bags. She asked me, Mom, why don't you give me a punching bag? Kids always want something, a punching bag. Well, I'm sorry I didn't get it, because she was very high strung, very spirited, and I think she needed to punch something. She first gained notoriety for being Hillary Swank's barring partner for Million Dollar Baby. She's had her fair share of amateur fights, but now she's a pro. I thought, oh, she'll do one fight and it'll be over. And that's what I've been telling myself ever since. That I'm resigned to the fact that this is what she wants. Freak out when she's on the ring. I know she's very good. And I'm so proud of her, but uh, it's, it's hard to see her fight. gym because I didn't think I looked good enough for my, my, my abusive boyfriend. I thought I was ugly. I thought I was fat. So I went to the gym to work out to try to better myself for him. And then boxing made me realize it's not about him because in boxing it's all about you. You're the only one in there. You're doing it for yourself. And that's where I got the strength to say, you know what? This is about me. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for, for coming on and for um, having me. You know, it's, it's every time I watch that video, I get super emotional because it's been a long journey for me. Um, and I want to take you back to when I first, uh, you know, when I, I, I first grew up in the Bronx. So I was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. I'm half Mexican, half Irish. And um, I, my mother and my father, my mother's Mexican, my father's Irish. My father was a retired NYPD detective. My mother worked for the airlines, which provided um, the opportunities for me to go to Mexico and visit family out there. I actually had more, I have more family in Mexico than I did the United States. But um, I was born a ginger, so I was very redheaded, freckly. My hair got kind of dark now. But uh, I was born a redhead and uh, people would look at me, but I spoke fluent Spanish. So I, I think that's when it really started that I felt like I kind of didn't belong um, or I couldn't connect with anybody because um, I was different. For growing up where I grew up in the Bronx, there weren't many Mexicans. And um, I was very, very proud of my culture. 
um, you know, being in Mexico most of my life and, and speaking fluent Spanish and learning it from a very early age. I mean, I remember it being my first language. It it was such a, it was, it was amazing for me, but at the same, same time, it was very difficult because I couldn't connect. I grew up with a lot of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and everybody had their own cultural, um, you know, their, their, their own cultural little things that they did. And with Mexico, it was very different. I loved going out there and uh, spending time out there. My brother, who's actually 10 years older than me, he was the polar opposite of me or is the polar opposite of me. So that's another reason why I felt very, very different, very alone, uh, kind of like I was on my own island. I also struggled with emotions. I struggled with um, a lot of anger. Uh, you know, growing up also, my father was bipolar. So I was raised by a bipolar father, which is really difficult. And, um, you know, it's not until now that I'm actually speaking about this because my father had passed away this April and I wanted to honor him and, and, and not share his story until it was time. And I, I know that I have his blessing now to share his story because it was a big impact on my life, which led me, I believe, through my whole life to this point right now, through, through my abusive relationships, through my boxing, through everything. But my father taught me a lot. He taught me how to be strong. He raised me like a human. And I say that because I wasn't treated like the girl. I wasn't treated like the boy. I was treated like a human. So basically, whatever my whatever I did, I paid the, the I paid the, the circumstances. I had to pay for it. If it was good, bad, or whatever. He just let me learn. My father was so strict that he actually locked me out of my house when I didn't come home on curfew. He said, okay, you're not going to come home on the right time. Then you're going to, you're going to get locked out of the house. A lot of people think that's really tough. Dad was definitely tough. Okay. And I know the bipolar definitely didn't help. And it was, it was challenging because I didn't feel like I received the amount of love that I needed to receive. Um, my mother, total opposite. My mother was loving and caring and giving and nurturing. My father was more of a provider, didn't really have that emotional connection. My brother, very quiet, um, stood to himself. He went to, he ended up going to pharmacy school, becoming a pharmacist, is now a welder, has his own business. Um, but growing up, I was a spark plug. Like my mom said, you know, I feel like she wanted to hit something. I just felt really misunderstood growing up. And I felt like I couldn't speak and I didn't have a voice. I felt like anything that I said, I didn't know how to communicate it. So I would act out. And um, it caused a lot of issues in my life. It caused me in high school, I ended up getting kicked out of high school. Now, mind you, I was like a straight A student. I had great grades, but I got bored. I'd get bored in class or I had trouble paying attention. And then I would either fail or I would get in trouble. Um, my junior year of high school, I was kicked out. Um, they said, okay, academically expulsion and academic expulsion. They said that I'd failed subjects. And you know, I, I just felt like everywhere I went, there was a door slammed in my face. Like I could never catch a break. And I'm like, I'm working so hard. What is this? Like, what do I have to do? How more do I have to prove myself? And that became probably my Achilles heel was proving myself, always feeling like I had to prove myself. I was never good enough. I was never worthy. And I think it started being with my father. i um, never feeling good enough for him because he was super hard on me. Um, never feeling good enough in my community because I didn't know. I mean, I was loved, but I didn't feel connected because I'm Irish and Mexican. That's a pretty different, you know, backgrounds. And I wasn't Irish enough for the Irish or Mexican enough for the, for the Latins, you know? And then when I went to Mexico, I wasn't Mexican enough for the Mexicans. And I, I, I really feel like that was, I'm mean, going back now. I feel like that was probably my biggest struggles. Um, when I got into high school, my, I, when I got kicked out, I ended up my senior year at a public school, which to be honest was probably the best education I got because I didn't have to follow any rules, which I also had a problem with. But that's also where I met my abusive boyfriend. Um, he was my best friend. Um, he actually tried to court me for about a year. Uh, I wouldn't date him. He was the muscle guy in the neighborhood. I was like, he has a bad reputation. I want no part of that. But he sent me flowers to school and do all these nice things. And I said, okay, finally, I, you know, I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll go out with you. I was 17 years old and uh, we dated. He was older than me and we dated for quite a, quite a while, but I noticed there was starting to be some changes and um, he started getting very aggressive with me. And, and very rude and very, um, but he was my best friend. That was the weird part that he was my best friend. We did everything together. I'm a diehard Yankee fan. I know they're not doing good right now. And sorry to you that hate the Yankees, but we'd go to the Yankee games together. We do a lot together. And I ended up, you know, ended up in that relationship because I, I, I believed in him and I trusted him. I started acting out, started getting aggressive, um, actually ended up punching me in my face, eight stitches above my eyebrow tried to strangle me to death, but it didn't start with physical abuse. It started with emotional. It started with verbal and then emotional. 
And, you know, I always say domestic, I'm a huge domestic violence um, advocate. I talk about it all the time about how important it is to people to know that it's not gender specific. It's not cultural specific. It doesn't just target one person or one culture or male or female. It's everybody. And, you know, knowing how to set boundaries and knowing how to, how to, how to you know, set the tone from the beginning, which is what I didn't do. I didn't say, okay, it's okay. You can talk to me like that. I allowed it to happen. Um, and it almost took my life. And I ended up going to the gym like you saw in the video, to better myself for him. And I felt like, okay, well, maybe if I'm prettier or, or, I'm, or I'm stronger or I look more fit, because he was very fit, that he would accept me. Um, but I don't think it was just about him. I think it was about my life leading up to that point, never feeling accepted and never really understanding who I was or really understanding what made, made me up. You know, and I feel like, you know, a lot of you obviously are all older now, you go back and a lot of people are afraid to go back and try to figure out what happened. Why did I end up where I am now and what got me here? And for me, opportunities like this really provide me that, that I can go back and I can remember and I can say, hey, how did I get to this point? And, you know, I always tell people like, there's really no difference between you guys and me. There really isn't. I'm on a stage. You guys are listening to my story. I'm humbled by that. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm just hoping that it can give you guys some insight into and relating to me a little bit about, wow, I can relate to that. Or I understand what she's going through. I understand what she struggled with. Um, but going back to that relationship, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like I could get out. I literally felt like I was in a corner, but it wasn't just that relationship. It was a lot of things that were going on in my life. I couldn't figure out because I couldn't connect. And at the end of the day, I couldn't connect with me. I couldn't, I didn't know where... I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. Was I doing the right thing? I questioned everything. And I think a lot of us go through that and you're like, oh yeah, you do all this stuff. You go through this. I can go back to my grammar school days, doing drugs, you know, um, drinking, doing all these things, partying, getting kicked out, barely making it out of grammar school, eighth grade, um, all these things. And I'm like, man, how did I get to where I am now? And the main thing is I, I fought, I kept fighting and I knew there was something better and something bigger. And it wasn't monetary gain. It wasn't, um, you know, stuff. It wasn't people. It was really me. I knew there was something inside of me that was destined for something bigger. Um, because I didn't, I don't, I don't feel, and I didn't feel during that time that this turmoil that I was feeling, this pain, this suffering, going through depression. I struggled with um, emotional eating. I mean, it's funny. Friends of mine would tell me you could be on Oprah, <laughs> like with your story, you know, you, they should do a movie about you or you should write a book. And, and I am writing a book and talking about my father's disease and mental illness because mental illness is real. And I struggled with it myself personally with depression. I was diagnosed with, uh, with clinical depression and um, I had emotional, I had, I was just completely isolating myself and um, depression is real. And I know a lot of people and some of you on this call right now are shaking your heads like, yeah, it really is real. And it's really hard to explain to people what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Cause you're like, I'm just sad. And they're like, oh, we'll just snap out of it. It's like, if I could, I would like, give me the blueprint, tell me how to do it. And then everything that I would try to do, whether it was, and this was during my time of boxing, I would try to, okay, let me just go out and go for a walk. But then the depression would just pull me back down. You know, it, it was, a, it was a lot of different things. Um, then I started to struggle with food because I was trying to, food became my addiction. I started to self-medicate with food. I went up to 180 pounds several times in my life where there was self-sabotage moments um, where I would actually get on the scale and try to eat to see how big I could get. And people would look at me like, why would you do that? Because I didn't think I was worthy because I just punished myself for things that I didn't even know why. I just didn't know why. I just couldn't figure out what is it that would make me happy? What is it that would make me feel whole or feel connected? And, um, you know, getting out of that relationship was probably the, the starting point for me where it wasn't easy. And a lot of you um, may, may know or have known somebody that was in an abusive relationship. It's very difficult to speak to an abused woman. It's very difficult. Um, nobody could talk to me. I hid everything from everybody. I didn't want anybody knowing. And yes, during that time I was going through my depression. Um, it wasn't as bad, but it was just starting. And, um, I just, it, it, I, I think it just started to just fester inside of me. And then the mistreatment and all that just started to just grow and just really eat at my soul. And, um, you know, I think that when you get to a place where you're so broken and you're so low, where they say you have to hit rock bottom, you really don't know what else to do and you're grasping at everything. But it was boxing for me 
that made me want to live. It was boxing that I felt was my key was that's it. That's, that's it. And it wasn't that I was going to become a professional boxer, never dreamt of being world champion, never thought I'd look like the girl on that screen right there. Never thought those things. Um, I just said, okay, what's next? What can I do? How can I get out of this? And it was okay. Go to the gym every day. There was a system in place. There was a structure. And I realized, okay, if I just do this every day, I can get out of this. For me, back in my depression, it started with brushing my teeth. Like I would get up in the morning, just brush my teeth, just get through that feet, make your bed, just get through that. Just, okay, now wash your face. It was literally like baby steps. And I'm not embarrassed to talk about them. And some people may be like, wow, that's, it, it was rough. And for those of you that, that, that understand depression or have seen somebody through it, even that alone is a lot of work when you're going through it. Um, and, you know, even today, I still have my down days, you know, I miss my father very much, you know, he, he passed away in April, and I know some of you have lost um, parents, and it's very difficult. And, um, but you know what, I'm like, okay, what, 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 what gets me through the day? So for me, that's where it started with boxing, and I go to the gym, and the gym got me through my day. I ended up going to college, I got my degree, I got my bachelor's in English, but it was the system that got me through the day, it was getting up in the morning and having a plan. Getting up in the morning and I say, make my bed. Some of you may have heard that quote about getting up in the morning. The first task of the day is making your bed, make your bed. And you, you start your day right. It's so true because it was back then that those little things made such a big difference for me. Just making my bed and celebrating making a bed. People are like, are you serious? Like, it's not a big deal. I'm like, well, when you're so low and you feel so bad, it is a big deal. Um, going forward, uh, you know, I went to the gym and, and I started to just, box. You know, I, I started training, but when I got there, it wasn't that easy. I actually went to a gym that was a fitness gym. And by the grace of God, they had a boxing ring in the back. And I went to the back because I was curious. And I was like, wow, I've seen this before. Now, when did I see this? So people have asked me, when did you fall in love with boxing? When did you find boxing? I got to say that baseball was my first love. I was never into boxing. I never was raised in it. And people were surprised knowing that my backgrounds are Mexican and Irish. They thought, well, somebody in your family boxed. Um, but no, they didn't. I was actually 15 years old the first time that I saw boxing. And I was at a friend's house and we were having a, a he was, his father was having a party, a fight party. They were in the living room. We were in the kitchen, just hanging out, a group of us. There was probably about six of us. And there was an uproar in the living room. So we all ran into the living room. And I'll never forget, it was when Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield's ear. And I was so blown away by that act because I was like, what is this? But what's interesting was it wasn't so much the boxing that caught my attention. It was the rage that Mike Tyson felt because I connected with that. I was angry. I had a lot of anger as a kid and a lot of confusion and a lot of emotional struggle. And people would ask me, well, if you had all that anger, how could you let somebody abuse you? Because it was anger at myself. It was all self. And I thought I deserved that. It was very weird. It was a very, um, very mixed up place that I was in. And um, I did go to therapy and I was medicated uh, multiple times in my life. You know, I believe that medication is a tool. And for me, um, I, I did, I, they diagnosed me, they misdiagnosed me with bipolar when I was 14 years old. And some of you may know about a, a, a drug called lithium, but to put a 14 year old on lithium is, is pretty severe. Um, and that happened. And I went on a, an array of, of, uh, of medications and, uh, fighting. I was a fighter. Even before I was boxing, I was a fighter. I believe we all are fighters. There's something inside of all of us that caused us to, us to keep fighting and to keep growing and learning and achieving. And yeah, we hit roadblocks. I hit, as you can see, multiple roadblocks to the point where it was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Like I'm tired. And that's why, you know, there was somebody that said about LeBron James, they're like, man, everybody sees LeBron James now, but nobody knows what it took for LeBron James to get there until we have opportunities like this to tell our story. And for me, these are just a little bit, this is just the, just the, um, just the, the simple facts of what I've been through, you know, um, the little things, um, but it was just so severe, you know, with, with more of it coming from myself and more of it coming from my emotional state and uh, my struggles. So when I went to the back of the boxing gym and I was like, hey, I remember this. I remember Mike Tyson biting a Vader Holyfield's ear. Not that I wanted to bite anybody's ear, but I was definitely like, okay, maybe this can help me get out some rage. You know, maybe I need to hit something. So um, because I speak Spanish and, and being Mexican, one of the trainers came up and he was um, Puerto Rican. And I said, okay, how can I connect a female? And I, I'm, I'm very feminine. I like to get my hair done, my nails done. 
And they were, all the guys back there were super tough. There weren't any girls back there. So I couldn't connect with anybody. And I said, okay, well, how can I connect with these guys? And I said, oh, I speak Spanish. I said, okay. So the Puerto Rican trainer, Willie Soto came up to me and he said, do you want to try? So I answered him in, in Spanish and he was like, oh, you're, you're Latin. I said, yes. You know, and we started talking a little bit and I just immediately felt connected. And I think that's what I needed to start. Um, and then it went on and it wasn't easy. It wasn't like, oh, they accepted me. They embraced me like, oh, she's a Mexican. She's Latin. She can come and be a part of us. No, it was like, okay, what's she going to do here? And most of the time, females in boxing back then, they didn't really go together. So when you saw a girl in the gym, she was nothing but problems because then the guys were going to look at the girl and then it was all distraction and then all this stuff. I definitely, that was not what I wanted. I mind you, I was at that time, I was still in the abusive relationship trying to get out. And the last thing I wanted to do was, was socialize with any men to that degree where I just wanted to just have something where I could find myself because I felt so broken. And um, I started training and I remember it was just, they would just teach me one, two, three, slip, slip. That's all I knew. And that's all they would show me. And so I would watch and I would study and I got really good at jumping rope and I got really good at hitting the speed bag because that's pretty much all I got to do. Um, the guys were sparring in the ring, you know, mock fighting, and I wasn't allowed to spar yet. Um, and then they look at me like, oh, but I felt like I got to prove myself again. This is where it started. You know, it started at my, as a child, but it was like, I got to prove myself. I got to show that I, I can be here. So I just kept doing what I did every day and I showed up and I worked hard. One thing that I can say about myself is that I will never not be the hardest worker in the room. And I'll always be the one making sure that I took the next steps. Okay, what's next for me? You know, or helping somebody else along the way. There was a there was a um, a guy there, a younger guy who was jumping rope, and I was so good at it that I actually offered to help him. And I think it insulted him, and he looked at me like, "Really? No, I'm good." But um, but yeah, so I started. So then I remember the first time that I sparred, and uh, there was a girl that they brought in, and she was very skinny and she was very small. And I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna kill this girl." I'm like, "I'm strong now. I know one, two, three, slip, slip. So this is gonna be great." It didn't go great. She was a, a, a former Golden Glove champion. I had no fights yet. We went to the ring. I'll never forget. It was the first round. And she hit me with a left hook right at my jaw. And I was like, I thought I broke my jaw. And I literally stopped the sparring. Everybody was watching. All the guys that I trained with that I was showing up every day that I was the hardest worker in the room. They were all watching me. And I just stopped the sparring. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. Everybody gets tested, not just in boxing, but in life. You're going to have tests and you're going to, that's going to decide which way you want to go. So in that moment of my test, I went home and I cried out of frustration because I was frustrated. I had just given about six months of my life to this sport. I was finding my groove. I was, you know, trying to get away from my ex-boyfriend or my boyfriend at the time. I was doing things right. I thought I was, I was going to school. I was working. I was trying to have a system and this girl just almost broke my jaw. So maybe this isn't for me. And I thought about it and I cried. And I remember the next day, that was a Friday. I'll never forget this. The next day was a Saturday and I knew that nobody was really in the gym early in the morning. So I went in, I went in and I started to work and I started jumping rope and I started hitting the speed bag and I started hitting the heavy bag. And I practiced that one, two, three slip, slip. Like it was nobody's business. And I think that's where a lot of people were surprised that I came back. Mind you, you're, you can't think about, this was back in 98. 99, 2000. Okay. Women's boxings come quite a bit a long way with the women's UFC, MMA, you know? Um, so back then it wasn't like this at all. There were girls that came into the gym, but then they'd leave and they were very athletic looking. I was not athletic looking. I never knew. I didn't even know I was an athlete until I got older. And I realized like, wow, I'm actually good at some stuff. My parents had me in every sport. They had me in softball because I had all this energy. They didn't they, my mother, like she said in the video, didn't know what to do with my energy. I was in softball. I was in soccer. I play an instrument. I speak two languages. I do all these things. Was I good at any of them? I just was bored. And I just felt like I wasn't a team player because, you know, if I'm playing, if I'm, if I'm running to first base, I'm going to, I'm going to plow through first base. If you're standing in my way, I just love that confrontation. I love that aggressive nature. I got fouled out of games playing basketball because I would like go for the jump ball and like rip it. And the girls would fly across the, 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 the court. You know, I was just too aggressive because I had all that energy and all that anger and all that emotional confusion inside of me. But through boxing, I've really found a place to center myself. And like I said in the video, you know, boxing is about you, you know, and for you guys, it may be something else. It may not be boxing. You know, I'm, I always say like, you know, people say that when you, when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. 
but I still believe in balance. If you have your job, you have everything you need to do for yourself, enjoy your job and, and be in a healthy environment, not a toxic environment or anything that's going to cause you stress. There's going to be challenges, but have a balance, have something for yourself. I've said to kids and they laugh at me when I speak to, uh, to the young kids, I'm like, Oh, um, it's, you know, uh, if, if it's basket weaving, if that's your, your thing, you want to basket weave. They're like, where did you come up with that? I'm like, I don't know, because I don't care what it is. If you find something that you're passionate about, you know, it could be cooking, find a hobby, find something, you know, for me, boxing started as a hobby and then it became my life. And the things that I've gotten to achieve and the things that I've gotten to see, and it wasn't because I dreamed of them, believe it or not, it's not because I dreamed of them. It's because I said, what's next? Of course I had goals, but I kept my goals small. you got to understand coming from a depression, coming from clinically depressed to the point where brushing your teeth was and making your bed was like the easy, the hardest thing that you overcame for the day. Achieving in boxing, I could have put so much pressure on myself and don't think that I didn't. There were times where I did put a lot of pressure on myself, but I had to pull back. It never ended well, trying to stay present. And I think through boxing, I learned all these, you know, like life hacks. You know what I mean? Like I got to understand these, these things about life because in boxing, you have to be in the moment. You know, you can't lapse for a moment. You got to be present every moment um, from the minute you show up into the gym. There was a lot of stress when I was going to the gym. You know, I had to learn how to leave it at the door. So I practiced something where I'd get to the, 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 door, the door to the gym and I'd look down at my feet and I'd say, I'm here, I'm here. And I would try to be there every moment throughout the day. I think when our minds start to go ahead or go back, it's just nothing but it just causes issues, you know, not being present. And I feel nowadays, even with social media, trust me, listen, I have 11,000 followers on social media. I understand like even people like, oh, you could do this, you could do that. I'm like, is that going to enhance my quality of life or hurt my quality of life? For me right now, I don't feel like it's going to enhance my quality of life. You know, I, I work, I have a job, you know, I'm an executive assistant. I also do some training. I, I hand pick the clients that I want to train with because with me boxing, I'm teaching you how to box, but what you're getting from me now, that's also what you get from me. So I have to, I only have so much of this to give. So I have about four clients and two of them are very young female girls. One's nine years old and one is, um, she's eight. And I love working with them because I feel like everything that I've gone through, I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I'm showing them like, hey, you don't have to go through this. I'm not overbearing or over pushing, but I make it fun because I wish I found boxing when I was younger. I wish I had something like that. And of course, my career went to go on and I did amazing things. Um, I was an amateur. I only had 12 amateur fights where women were not in the Olympics. Boxing, female boxing was not introduced to the Olympics until 2012. I didn't have the opportunity. I had 12 amateur bouts. I fought, I went to nationals twice. My second fight, I went to nationals. Um, that was an interesting challenge. Uh, I, I flew out to Chicago on my own dime because back then nobody was paying my way. So I worked and I went to school because my dad said, in this house, you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. My parents were not super supportive of my boxing. They were like, you know, my mother was like, why do you want to do this? My brother was like, this is crazy. And my father was like, well, if you're going to do it, it's not going to be easy, but you're going to do this, this, and this. And then, then you can do it. I said, okay. So I got to prove myself and I went to school, I boxed and I worked. And um, I think it really helped me to, to really work on my focus and, and my work ethic because it was very difficult. Um, I didn't have much of a life where that's where I think the balance, I started to struggle with the balance because I was just always busy. You know, I was, I was trying to just get to the next place and trying to prove my dad wrong. And uh, I think I boxed for the first, I don't know, six years <laughs> to prove my dad wrong. And uh, then uh, it wasn't until I, well, I was, it was, I was an amateur still when Hillary Swank came into Gleason's gym in Brooklyn and uh, they partnered me with her and they said, okay, you guys are gonna be working together. I was 24 years old. And they said, okay, you, you guys will work together. We'll spar together. And people ask me all the time, like, why did your coach put you with her? Why did, why were you partnered with her? Why were you chosen to be her primary sparring partner? I said, because whenever I trained or whenever I sparred, I didn't go in there to kill anybody. Cause I wanted to, I wanted to beat you up in the fight. I didn't want to beat you up in the sparring because it was more about executing my game plan and just trying to do what I needed to do well. And in that way I would end up beating people up but it wasn't with that intention of violence where, and some of you may understand this and some of you may think it's a little crazy, but I punch people in the face for a living. So a little crazy, but when you get into a fight in an actual boxing match, there's a switch that goes off. 
And you see the person here that's sitting here talking to you all. And then you see the girl in the photo in the background. You're like, I, that's vicious. Of course, when I'm in there, I'm vicious. When I'm in there, it's not a human on the other side of the ring. It's a target and I'm going to win. I'm super competitive and I'm very good at what I do. And I'm very secure in my work ethic and in my talent. But I wasn't always, you know, like I told you, everything that I'd been through led to these moments and it's overcoming each one of those obstacles and really doing some self inventory where I would write. I was a, you know, I was a writer and I would journal because I couldn't get my words out. I couldn't express how I felt um, physically or, or, you know, vocally. So I would write. I have tons of journals uh, of me, you know, just writing how I felt of things that I, and it felt good. So what I could recommend for some of you that may relate to this and may feel a certain way, write, even if it's with a significant other, I found that even in my relationships, I would, you know, if I felt something, I would write it down first and just get it out and say, do I really need to say this to this person? Or is this worth it for me? And it helped a lot. People say, oh, that's a lot of work. I'm like, well, that's life. Life is work. And, uh, you know, boxing correlates to life so much. Think about it. Roll with the punches. You know, um, that's, that's huge. And when you get knocked down, knocked down, you get back up. Um, I've been knocked down twice in boxing. You know, my record's 29 and two with 13 knockouts. Um, I'm very humble and I'm very grateful for, for all of it, for what I've achieved. You know, I've been to, you know, um, Oscar award winning, like I, I worked with Hillary. I was, I was, uh, they, she talked about me, the Oscars, um, you know, I was on, I was in people magazine. Instagram wasn't as big back then. So I'm sure I'd have tons of followers now um, back then, but I was in people magazine, sports illustrated in touch weekly. Um, I was on every channel, CNN, you name it. They, I had friends of mine that were calling me like, Hey, you're on CNN. I never got like too distracted by that because, you know, talent gets you, fame gets you in the door, but talent keeps you in the room. I heard that quote a long time ago. And I was like, I didn't understand that life, the, the famous and the, even signing autographs. I, I didn't understand like people wanted my autograph. I mean, I was humbled and I was grateful and I was like, wow, like I'm having an impact. But then I saw a responsibility, a responsibility to be authentic, which I felt I always was, but even now more so, I got to really come to grips with who I am. I got to really understand my why. I got to, so it helped me. Other people looking up to me and, and wanting to meet me helped me be a better me. And I'm always grateful for that. It, it, I, I say it wasn't always me. You know, I'm a Christian. God is my higher power. And I believe in, you know, giving it to God and, and, and having faith and knowing that not everything's in your control, whatever your belief is, not everything's in your control, because that's a really tough place to be. I thought that everything was in my control for a really long time. And it's not. That's just life. Life, you got to flow with it. And I struggle still to this day. There's moments but opportunities like this, where I have to, where I speak, I have the opportunity to speak and to share. I go back and I'm like, man, remember when you overcame that? Remember when you overcame this? You guys should do the same thing for yourselves. When you're hitting that roadblock and you're hitting that tough place and you're like, man, I don't know what to do. I'm just lost. Take a moment, pause. Because that's what you do in a boxing match. When I'm boxing and I get hit with a good shot, you think I'm going to jump back in there and let that girl wail on me again? No, I'm going to step back. I'm going to move around. I'm going to reassess. I'm going to think. I'm like, okay, are you okay? Recover. People should do that in life. But everybody's like head on in, like more, more. You got to do more. It's like, sometimes you don't. And society, society makes it hard for us too. You know, because especially with the, I see young kids with the social media and everything's, nobody's present. Everybody's taking a picture, doing a video, sharing everything on Instagram. I challenge you, any of you, to stay off of Instagram for, I say, I start with 24 hours. I did it for seven days, five days, three days. Challenge yourself. I, and not because I want to say, oh, you can't do it. I want you to see the clarity that you have. If you take, I do, I call them technology detox, where I, I obviously can't get off email because of work but I completely get off social media for 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. Sometimes I go seven days. It depends on how I'm feeling. It depends on what I'm going through because I feel like I get so distracted focusing on that, that I can't focus on me and the actual problems that I'm having in my life or the actual challenges that I'm, I'm having in those moments. So take, take 24 hours and just watch how you reach for your phone, delete the apps because you're going to find that you automatically grab your phone. Some of you may be shaking your head like, yeah, I've done this. I know exactly what you're talking about. Some of y'all may be saying, you're crazy. I ain't doing that. There's no need. I'm fine. Trust me. When you see how that has such a control over you, it's scary.
because you're like, oh, like I did it a couple of times in the beginning. I went to grab my phone. I'm like, oh, I don't have Instagram. It's off my phone. I'm like, wow, I, I, I have to realize that I can't do this. And, and, you know, for anybody, I don't, whether you have depression, you have some, you're struggling with some mental illness, anything like that. Start with that. Start with clearing those things out. Then look at your relationships. Look at who's around you. I've, I've had friends in my life that I've had to say, Hey, I can't be your friend right now. And they look at me like, I'm like, it's just too much work. I just can't right now. And some of those friends have come back into my life and some of those friends I've lost, but I've learned through life to set boundaries. I learned through boxing to set boundaries. I learned from my dad. You know, my, my dad, I had to set boundaries with my dad when I got older, because when I was a kid, he could tell me what to do. And mind you, my father, amazing. I am the woman I am today because of my father, of course, because of my mother, but because of my dad, I'm so my father's daughter and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I went through what I went through with him, but I'm grateful that I learned how to set boundaries and I learned how to say, Hey, that's not okay. Don't talk to me like that. Or I want, or I can walk away from things and be like, Oh, but you can fight everybody. I don't want to fight anybody. What's crazy is the minute I learned how to fight. Sure. Listen, I'm from the Bronx. I got into fights in the street. Not when I box though. You know, in my neighborhood, it was about respect. You had to like, you know, if somebody started with you or whatever, you had to, you know, kind of be like, all right, what do you want to do? You know what I mean? I mean, that was back then. Nowadays, you know, it's a little crazy, but I didn't want to fight after I started boxing. I had no desire because I got all that anger, all that aggression out. And I recommend to you guys, if you, you know, boxing is a great outlet and I'm not sitting here soliciting boxing, but to a degree, if you feel like you need to hit something, go to a fitness gym where they have some boxing and, and, and hit some stuff, you know, um, learn a little bit, you know, it's, it's just such a different, it's such a different creature. It really is. And, you know, I turned pro, I went on to win two world titles and two regional belts. And I'm even facing stuff right now because I was ranked number one in the world. And unfortunately, I mean, surprise, surprise, there's politics in boxing. I'm being, I'm being facetious. I, everybody knows there's politics in boxing. It's one of the most corrupt sports, but you know what? I knew that going into it, but the best part is I didn't get into boxing because I was trying to like fight the politics or fight the people. I got into boxing to heal. And if it's not healing me, then I'm not going to do it, but I can, if I want to. So I'm ranked, I was ranked number one in the world. And, and unfortunately they, they, my titles got given to two other females. I mean, I think there's a number of reasons why women's boxing is very skewed. Um, there's girls that are here like myself, and then there's girls that are down here. And then there's the Olympians that got promotion and we didn't get the promotion. So there's a lot going on. I could talk about that for days too, but I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be angry. I want to love what boxing gave me. And if it's meant to be in my life, it's always going to be in my life. But if it's meant to come back around where I compete, I will. And I know that I can, you know, but I found something else that I want to do now. I went to the gym and I'm like, you know what? I want to maintain my muscle. I want to be healthy. So I started doing like a bodybuilding workout and I love it because it's maintaining my body. It's giving me balance. I can eat because boxing, it was a lot different. I had to maintain a weight. So I'm learning more. It's like you reinvent yourself every time you face a challenge or you have to let go of something, you reinvent yourself. But in order to do that, you got to really connect with yourself. So what I recommend is like, if there's anybody where you feel disconnected, and I think that was my problem when I was younger, I felt so disconnected because I didn't know how to connect with myself. And I feel like sometimes people never know. Boxing forced me to connect with myself because it's the truth serum. When you're in that ring and people are punching you in the face, you better be present. You better be really in touch with yourself because it's going to hurt if you're not. <laughs> but, and outside of it, you can't cheat. You can't, you can't um, cut corners in boxing. You know, it, it is what it is. You're either going to get hit or not get hit. And then you've got to hit back and then you got to win. And it's really unforgiving. And I always say that boxing, number one, boxing was the architect that rebuilt me. And boxing also taught me what my parents couldn't. Was it the harder way to learn? Yes. Do I recommend it for everybody? No. But I do recommend trying the workout or doing something physical for yourself, even if it's a 20 minute walk. Me getting up in the morning, making my bed, brushing my teeth, washing my face and going for a 20 minute walk probably saved my life. Probably saved my life. Just starting the structure and starting the, the game plan and doing that and understanding, accepting yourself, embracing yourself and really knowing your why. Like, why did I box? Okay, first time I boxed was to prove my dad wrong. Why did I continue to box? Because I wanted, I wanted to prove that I wasn't just a sparring partner for an actor, an, uh, an Oscar award winner. Okay. Now why, why did I box like that? Because I can, I've moved several times in my life. I lived in Bronx. I went to Brooklyn. I went to Jersey. I went to, to Mexico. I went to California and now I'm in Florida. And I did all this because of boxing, because I wanted to pursue my career. And I said, okay, life in boxing. 
And I got to experience so much. I've traveled so much. I've spent time in Panama, a beautiful country. I, I've seen so many things. I got to fight in Mexico several times. I won my first world title out there. Those are things people can't take away from you. And, you know, and it's nice when I can share them on Instagram and say, hey, I did this and this is what I got out of it. Try it. You know what I mean? Try, try to step out of your comfort zone. I dance salsa. I dance bachata. I go to salsa classes twice a week now because I love to dance. And I can because my legs aren't shot from boxing. You know, I'm trying to find balance in life. And people are like, man, you're so open and you're so vulnerable. I feel like being vulnerable. I mean, men, women, anybody like it's because you own your truth. When you own your truth, vulnerability isn't so dangerous. It's when you're unsure and you're afraid. But if you're not in a safe place, of course, you're not going to want to be vulnerable. But see, I create my space. I create my safe place. Sure, I don't know a lot of you, but I'm safe because I created my safe place. If you create your safe place for yourself, it's easy to speak. That's why I'd be like, oh, you're so confident. You're so secure. I'm like, yeah, I wasn't always like this. And don't think I don't falter. Don't think I don't have days where I, I question myself. But I'm quick to get back on the horse and say, nope, been here before. You know where it leads to. And you know what you got to do. But you've got to overcome those challenges before you can get to that place. And, you know, a lot of you could just be resonating with me right now, being like, yeah, some of you may need the reminder. And some of you, this is your first time hearing it. And I really pray that my message and anything that I have to offer today can give you some insight into something for yourselves. You know, because like, listen, I never thought. I would be that girl, but I stepped out of my comfort zone and I worked on me. And then sure enough, here I am being given the opportunity to have 40 minutes of your time or an hour of your time, which I'm grateful for because time is something you can't get back. And for you guys to listen. And I just pray that this gives you guys something, um, you know, something that, that can light something in you and maybe share your story with other people. Don't think it has to be on a platform like this. I've spoken in giant events and I've spoken just one-on-one -on -one to people just because I found the opportunity to say, hey, I think I can give this person something, give him some, some motivation, some inspiration. And then sometimes I always say, God talks to me through me. So sometimes you'll get a message for yourself. But if you guys have any questions, I'm completely open to any questions. And thank you so much for, for this opportunity and for listening. And so wow. we did have um, one question in the chat. Um, <laughs> it was like, how do you or did you keep the passion for what you were doing? It's so funny. People ask me that. They're like, how do you get up every day? And, you know, I just said, what's next? Like, I just wanted to be better than I was before. And that's when you know that it's your passion. Because when you know, you know, you know, like, I just, I just wanted to be better. And I didn't put that extra, I didn't put that extra pressure on myself. I would just say, okay, what do I got to do? And listen, Muhammad Ali said it, like he hated training, you know, but he loved fighting and training was hard, but I love the challenge because I knew it was going to make me better. Because listen, when I ran two miles, when I ran one mile, I was running one mile for a week. Then I ran two miles. I knew I was better. And then, I, and if you don't get, feel good about doing this, you know, everybody feels good about progression, progression. And sure, but you've got to remember that sometimes you got to take two steps back to go three steps forward. And it's just being kind to yourself. And I think being kind and, and, you know, to be honest, like I had people I could talk to, I had good people around me that I could say, Hey, like I wanted to give up. Listen, when I was depressed, I want to give up so much. My manager, who was actually my, my first boxing coach that took me to fight amateurs, because nobody wanted to train me. I left that out of store. Nobody wanted to say, like, who's this girl? Like, look at her. Who wants to train her? Nobody gave me a shot. But my manager, Luigi Ilchese, who was my first coach that took me to compete, he believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. So having good people around you that can remind you of who you are when you seem to forget, I think that's really, really important. Wow, Maureen, I have to tell you, your story is just so powerful. I'm looking at all of the chat, all of the messages that are going through and people are like, wow, you know, and, and I will tell you, I grew up in the Bronx as well. So I know all of the struggles that, you know, that we had to go through in the Bronx and the struggles that took us to where we're at, you know, right now. Um, you know, just thinking about what you were saying regarding, you know, growing up with your dad being bipolar, we could all, a lot of us in here could resonate with that you know, with, with parents, uh, maybe not being that ideal person, but, you know, we still have love for them and they still have love for us, um, you know, and we, and we still cherish our childhood and we, we know and the struggles that we go through. I think it's learning to forgive them. I think for me, the biggest thing was learning to, listen, I was, I was mad at my mom and mad at my dad for a long time because my mom, my dad would be super mean, super hard on me. And my mom would be like, oh, but honey, he's sick. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I didn't understand that, you know, but I learned to forgive. 
you know, I learned to sit back and say, man, like, I have to forgive because it's so true. And you see those quotes about people saying like, oh, if you, if you, if you hold harbor hate or anger, you're drinking a poison yourself. And it's true. And I've learned to pray for those people and just say, you know what? I wish them well, you know, but don't get, don't think I don't get challenged. I mean, I'm challenged every day with that, you know, especially in the boxing world, you know, cause people come up to me like, oh, how come you're not fighting? I'm like, oh, you really want to know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm like, why am I going to be bitter and angry? I'm just going to be honest. I'm just honest. And I find that honesty and forgiveness really, really help give you a peaceful life. <laughs> awesome. Does anyone have any additional questions for Maureen? Again, we have someone who worked with Hillary, Hillary Swank here. I saw the movie myself. You know, <laughs> my, the question that I have, you know, for you, how did you get hooked up with her? How, how did that happen? So it's funny. So I trained at Gleason's gym. So, and this is the thing, whenever I speak, I have so much detail I can give you guys. So I love the questions. So please, anybody feel free if you have any questions about anything. Um, so when I was in Gleason's gym, a lot of actors and actresses would come in there to train. John Leguizamo was in there. Usher was in there. 50 Cent would come in there for training for roles. So Hillary came in and she was recommended to train with my boxing coach at the time, Hector Roca. And, um, but Hector knew that when I would get in the, when I would get in the ring and train, I didn't, I just tried to like work on my skill set. I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. So I never went hundred percent. And so he knew he could trust me with her. Like if she hit me with a good shot, I wasn't going to retaliate um, with a good shot. You know what I mean? I was smart. So like, even when I would spar and I would train, if I got hit with a good shot, I wouldn't like, it's funny because I was super impulsive when I was younger, but I realized the impulsivity didn't help you. So I would get hit with one shot and then I come back and hit them again. And then they'd hit me and it was like a bang, 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 bang. So I'm like, no, let me work on moving my head. So, I mean, to this day, my, my defense is superb. Like there's, I can say there's really no female out there that can move their head like me, their defensive movement. And then I counter off the defense. So for me, that's why, because I was like, all right, if I get hit, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to learn how to move my head. And then I can come back with something. So with her, she was safe with me. And I'll never forget the first time she got in the ring with me. She was so nervous. And I saw it in her. I was like, you can trust me. I'm not going to hurt you. Like, you can trust me. And she was just like, okay. Because it's a big deal. You know, I have a client now that I, I train. She's got two sessions with me. I'm like, oh, wait till we spar. She goes, you're not going to hit me. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. And I'm like, listen, I'm not going to hit you. I said, listen, I, if an Oscar award winner can get in the ring with me, I got in the ring with, um, with Joan Rivers. Okay. I've been in the ring with you name it. Like people were like, what? Yeah. Joan Rivers got in the ring with me and we, we sparred play mock fighting to get her an outfit. Like she had to have, yeah, Joan's great. She was doing, cause her and her daughter did the, the TV guide awards. Uh, they did the red carpet and she had to find her knockout dress. So it was the dress that she knocked me out in. <laughs> that was the whole, the whole shift. You know, it was funny. We did a lot. I did a lot of TV work. Um, I did, um, I was an ESPN, I was, I'm a commentator. I've done ESPN Combates, uh, um, Noche de Combates in Spanish. Um, I've done a lot of those different things. So the experiences that I've had, but you know what? Actors are people too. You know what I mean? Like she, and, but Hillary, I mean, some of them are a little different, but Hillary was so down to earth. She worked so hard and that's why she won the role because she deserved it. She worked so hard. She lived like a fighter. She took the train to the gym every day. She, there were days she didn't want to be there. And I remember, and I'm like, girl, I feel you. I feel the same way, but we're here. So she really committed to the role. She lived the life of a fighter. Good. Any additional questions, Sam? Not in the chat, no. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask me questions? Okay. Well, look, you know, we're getting ready to go, um, you know, into that hour. Question, but what do you think about pro boxer? Is that a question? Oh, yeah. Honest? What do you think about pro boxers transitioning to fighting in the UFC and vice versa? Oh, oh that's a great question. question. Great. See, there you go. Okay. Uh, this is my, this is, so um, it's different. Okay. I know that a lot of females are doing that now. And I think that's because they're not making the money in boxing. Um, Listen, the female and the, 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 the money that women make in boxing is a joke compared to the men. I fought on paper. It's not a way to survive. I've always worked in box because I couldn't do, and I didn't want to sit there and just getting sponsors. It's very difficult. Um, as far as I see more, more MMA fighters now coming into boxing than I, cause there's more money for the men in boxing. Uh, we have Vitor Belfort who fought Evander Holyfield. He was supposed to fight Oscar De La Hoya. Vitor Belfort trains with us. Um, Dustin Poirier trains at the gym that I run actually, where, um, I'm, I'm the executive assistant to Phil DeRue, who was the strength and conditioning coach for, for Dustin Poirier. And he's also, he was also my strength and conditioning coach and Dustin's in, but Dustin's a, a boxing purist. Like he loves boxing, but he'll stick to MMA. He's not, you never, I don't think you're ever going to see Dustin get into a boxing ring. Um, I think it's really about money. And a lot of the things now it's about entertainment. You know, the Jake Pauls of the world, I'm not hating. I have a lot, I have a lot to say about those things. And 
those are questions that I will be more than happy to take on my Instagram. If you want to follow me and DM me, um, Maureen underscore Shay on Instagram and my Facebook um, and Twitter. I'm, I'm just Maureen Shay on Twitter. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Boxing is it's entertainment. And if you don't understand the promoters, like you're not going to see top rank and golden boy. You're not going to see those types of promoters or, or, or PBC, like promoting those types of events. You're going to see more of like the trillers, like even matchroom won't do it. You're seeing more of these other ones. Matchroom, I think did it once or twice, but the old school boxing guys are kind of like, uh, but everybody's like, oh, this is the new wave. I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting to see, but some of these MMA fighters like Vitor Belfort, um, he was phenomenal in the UFC, phenomenal fighter. And he was actually a really good boxer. Some of them are really good at boxing, but some of them, not so much. They've got to learn, but I'm glad to see more um, MMA fighters now doing um, doing the boxing training because I think having hands with stand-up is huge. I mean, look at Holly Holm when she beat Ronda Rousey and what she did, you know, and her background was also kickboxing. So uh, that really helps a lot, you know, learning how to use the jab and, and learning distance. But um, I think it's interesting. I don't think, I'm not mad at it. And I never hated MMA. I, I, I'm a fan of MMA. I think it's phenomenal what they do. I'd never do it. Nobody's breaking my arm or kicking me in the face. Mm -mm, no way. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm not tough. It's just not for me. <laughs> All right. So look, I want to say thank you, Maureen. You did an incredible job. I think I'm, I'm just blown away with your story. You know, a lot to take away from this. And I hope every single member of our cross-country family uh, you know, take something away from this because we're all hard workers. We persevere. We know what the struggles are in our day-to-day -day lives and at work. Um, so hopefully something that Maureen said this afternoon resonated with you. Um, Maureen, again, please accept our thanks for showing oh, up and giving thank us an incredible so story and we wish you well. Thank you so much. You too. God bless you guys. All right. Bye-bye.